It's time to sit back, relax, and listen to Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life will inspire, motivate, and empower you. Live your best life now. Listen, learn, think, and decide. Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. And now, here's your host, Joan Herman. Welcome to Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. You're listening to us in your neighborhood, from coast to coast, and around the world. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Joan Herman, author, speaker, and your host. For four years, Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life has been bringing you interviews with some of the most inspirational and influential people in the world. It's our goal to educate and empower you so you can live your best life now. Thank you for taking time for yourself, and thank you for letting us be a part of your life. We have another great show for you today. Joining me is Richard Bowles, author of the book, What Color Is Your Parachute? A Practical Manual for Job Hunters and Career Changers. Dick is here to help you navigate and understand the new job landscape. Dick is credited with founding the modern career counseling field, and it's been called the most recognized job hunting authority on the planet by the San Francisco Chronicle, and ARP has named him America's top career expert. Welcome, Dick. Thanks for joining us today. You're very welcome, John. Dick, we are in the middle of an unemployment crisis. Unemployment is up, job supply is down, college graduates can't find work. The figures are depressing. What is going on in today's job market? Generally, employers are cautious now. The biggest issue for any employer when they're going about hiring is risk. They want to minimize the risk that they're taking because it costs them an awful lot of money if they hire the wrong person and then have to let them go. So, Uh, What's happened since the 2008 Great Recession is that employers are much more scared. They are much less willing to take risks. So they are cautious about hiring. They're cautious about adding to their costs because uh, employers tend to see people as costs. Uh, We tend to think of it as a job and so on. But for an employer, it's a deduction from the profit that they're making. So they're being cautious. They're hiring part-time when they can rather than full-time. They're hiring people just for contract periods rather than for uh, on and on into the year or years ahead. So that's the explanation for it. Until they get confident that they're not going to be taking as many risks and the economy is better uh, in helping them avoid that, they will start hiring again. But until that time happens, we're faced with the situation you just described. Dick, you've been doing this for 40 some odd years. Have you ever seen anything like this before? I mean, to me, it seems like in corporate America years ago, there was that mentality where a a corporation took pride in bringing an employee in and taking that person along. I mean, some people started in the elevator as an elevator operator and worked their way up to a president of a division. Yeah, there's an old uh, saying in the hiring field, and that is, unemployment is bad if you're the one out of the job. So therefore, each of us sees it from our own perspective. Now the media love to talk about the general picture, what's going on in the entire country. But for the average person, being out of work and having difficulty in finding new work is a crisis. And of course, millions of people outside of the periods we now call recessions Millions of people during good times couldn't find work. So what is different now is we have a broader context in which to see how many people and see what that is doing to the country as a whole. So no, in one sense, I've never seen it like this, of course. In another sense, yes, I have, because every time you deal with a group of people who have been out of work for a long time, their little mini world, the small world within which they move, they see this kind of a crisis occurring that we now see happening nationwide. So, Dick, with the scenario that we've just explained, layoffs, downsizing, reduced number of new jobs, job sharing, increased part-time jobs, are people stuck in dead-end jobs with no options? Do they really need to stay in that job where there's no growth? Everything depends on how skilled they are at job hunting. It's not often commented on, but job hunting is itself a skill. And you either are good at it or you're terrible at it. If you're terrible at it, then, of course, you're going to have the feeling that you're stuck in a dead-end job and there's no way you can get out of it because you don't know how to get out of it. If you are good at job hunting, which means you have to know alternative ways of going about anything. You have to know 
alternative ways to describe who you are. You have to find alternative ways to describe what it is you can do. You have to find alternative ways of actually searching for vacancies or for the kind of employer that you want to find a job with. So people are stuck in dead-end jobs if they have no skills at job hunting. They can get easily out of those dead-end jobs if they develop better skills at going about searching. So for the person who has spent 15, 20, 25 years, an entire career with a company only to be laid off or lose their job for one reason or another, when you're in your 40s or 50s, it may seem next to impossible to find a job. You hear over and over again, you're too old, you're overqualified, you have too much experience. So what can this person do to hone those skills that you're talking about? Well, they can get familiar with how job hunting is done and what those alternatives are, first thing. Second thing they can do is they can do a self-inventory. We have learned over the years that when people sit down and do research and everyone assumes, oh yes, research, I know, I'm supposed to research the job market, I'm supposed to find out what are the 10 hottest jobs and so on, and that's a mistake. There is research needed, but it must be research on yourself. The problem is that when we've done work for a long time, as you were saying, 15, 20, or 25 years, we start to have a conception of ourself that locks us into our past, ties, ties ourselves to our past. So if you sit down and do a self-inventory where you break down who you are and what you've done into kind of its basic building blocks, and then reconstruct an idea of yourself in a new light, this so changes the equation on success in job hunting that it's astounding. We discovered over the years that if you start with a self-inventory, you have an 84% chance of not only finding work, but finding work that's appropriate and matches who you are. So it makes a huge difference if people start with that. If they say, okay, I had this whole career, I've now got to rethink not just how to job hunt, I've got to rethink who I am and what it is I have to offer to the world. They can get out of that situation. Dick, what do you think are the biggest mistakes job hunters make today? I mean, I know in my company, recently I tried to hire someone and I received cover letters that were written as though someone was texting to me with the letter U instead of Y-O-U in a conversational tone as though we've known each other for years. So uh, to me, maybe I'm just getting old, but that seems so inappropriate. So what do you think people are doing wrong out there? We're all getting older, Joan. <laughs> <laughs> we're all born, mourning for the worlds that we used to know. Um, the biggest mistake that job hunters are making is in thinking that it's up to somebody else to find them the work. They, they think that they should it should be the government or it should be somebody out there who makes it their job to find work for them. Um, and they are therefore not willing to work hard enough. And it's harsh to say that. The problem is they don't give enough time. For example, they did a survey a couple of years ago of college grads who couldn't find work immediately and went back home temporarily to live with their parents. And they asked them, typically, how many hours a week are you spending on your job search? The answer was one, one hour a week. Now, I, if I had a lost dog, I couldn't find that lost dog in one hour a week. They're just not allotting enough time. They're hypnotized by the idea of the internet where you can post your resume at night and wake up in the morning and there'll be a perfect match for you. A lot of this mythology is created by technology. It's not that the technology can do this or that. It's that the person thinks the technology can do this or that. Dick, you just mentioned technology. What is the role of social media in today's job hunt and how has technology impacted the process? Well, in understanding what job hunting is, you have to make a distinction between the the core of job hunting and the outward appearance of it. When you ask yourself, what is the core of job hunting? The core of job hunting is essentially like dating. It's two people, employer and job hunter, sitting down and saying, what do you think? Do we want to try going steady? So the job hunter is asking, do I really want to work here? The employer is asking themselves, do I really want to have this person work here? And so on. 
So what social media has done is not changed the core of job hunting. That's stayed the same all these years. What has changed is the outward way in which that job hunter, that conversation is conducted. So, for example, uh, the role of social media is illustrated with a site on the Internet called LinkedIn. You used to have to go hunt. It was called networking. Everyone knew it. Everyone knew, hey, if I'm job hunting, I have to network. They weren't always clear what that meant, but they knew essentially it was collecting as many business cards as they could against that day when they might need to search through those cards and see if there was somebody who could help them. It was very generic and very vague. Then the uh, social media came along. Social media, by definition, is any site on the Internet, particularly, where people gather, where more than one person gathers. So what the social media has done is it's changed the face of the job hunt, the outward appearance of it. The social media has made it easier for me to find people and, and LinkedIn above all else because I don't have to do networking in the old way anymore. I can pinpoint what I need. I can go on LinkedIn to find particular organizations that I'm interested in. I can find out from LinkedIn who it is that either does work there now or used to work there, and they can search my links, which I have asked people to form with me, or my friends and business acquaintances and the people I run into now week by week. I can ask LinkedIn to tell me which of those might form a connection for me. So it's changed that outward appearance of the job hunt for the better and made, in some cases, it easier to do the essential tasks that the job hunt is always involved. Dick, is today's resume the same as it was 10 or 20 years ago? No. What's changed? Google. You think about what a resume is. First of all, most people thought of the resume as a sales piece. It was supposed to sell you to the employer. And we got wisdom about that over years and we discovered no really the purpose of a resume is to get yourself an invitation you want to get invited in for an interview so you don't put anything in the resume that isn't going to help uh, get you invited in the good thing about that from one point of view was that you controlled what the employer could know short of hiring a private detective or maybe talking to your previous employers they couldn't find out much more that you didn't want them to find out Now, with Google, Google is your new resume. Employers, uh, the figures vary year by year, but it's certainly up to 80% now. 80% of all employers now go on the Internet and Google your name if they're seriously considering you, and they look up anything that's up there. And, And you don't necessarily control that because some of your friends may have posted some dumb pictures from a Labor Day weekend with you some years ago, and they're still up there, and so on. So that's changed radically what the what the resume is about and the form of that resume. So I tell people, first Google yourself and go search for what's up there about you, and, and certainly there are ways to remove things you don't want, and if you don't know how to do that, all you have to do is put it into the search engine. How do I remove stuff from, and you say Facebook or or LinkedIn or whatever. So the employer will go searching for you, and they do tell me they actually reject candidates from what they find by Googling your name on the Internet. Dick, before we run out of time, the one thing I want to make sure we get in is the part about the salary negotiations. That's always a question that people dread. I know that I have in my past. You never know how to answer that, especially with everything that we've just described. Have we gotten to a point where we are really at the mercy of employers? Is there still room for negotiations? With some kinds of jobs, yes. With others, no. Uh, There are several kinds of offers an employer may make if they decide they want you. They may offer you full-time work, which, of course, is everyone's dream. They may decide they can only offer you part-time work, so they'll offer you a contract and commensurate salary for that. Or they may decide they can offer you just a project, which means they'll hire you to get this particular project off the ground and running, and then you have to go looking for work again, and they'll tell you what they'll pay you for that. So negotiation happens for one reason and one reason only, and that is the employer doesn't initially mention how much they're willing to pay you. They try to lowball you and say, well, we're willing to pay this for the job. If you've done research... You know what a reasonable 
salary is for the work they're offering you. And you can say to them, I'm looking for work in a range that goes from this to this. We tell people, always talk in a range. Don't give a single figure when you're trying to argue for a certain salary. And negotiation is all about trying to mention a range that hooks under the top of theirs and goes up from there. So you say, well, I'm looking for a job in the range of 33000 to 40000 And you can say that because you've done the research. If you haven't researched this before you ever go into the interview, then you're, you can't really do salary negotiation. The book is What Color Is Your Parachute? A Practical Manual for Job Hunters and Career Changers by Richard Bowles. If you'd like more information about Dick and his work, you can visit the website jobhuntersbible.com. We'll be right back. Anxiety is one of the most common mental health challenges in the United States. More than 50 million people have been diagnosed with anxiety disorders, and countless others struggle with low self-esteem, isolation, insomnia, and other debilitating effects of anxiety. Today's guest, Dr. Friedman Schaub, helps people move beyond fear and anxiety so they can tap into their true potential to heal, change, and succeed. His new book, The Fear and Anxiety Solution, is a step-by-step guide that explains how to transform fear and anxiety into powerful allies, messengers, and healing catalysts that lead to greater confidence, self-worth, and success. Welcome, Dr. Schaub. Thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm very happy to be on your show. Doctor, as I said in the introduction, more than 50 million people have been diagnosed with anxiety disorders, and I'm going to assume that most of those people are medicated in in some form, and your work strives to reach the subconscious root causes of fear and anxiety. Why is that so important? Well, you know, I think uh, when we really look into our fears, and I believe the number is actually much higher than 50 million, these are only the people that have been diagnosed. And when we are, you know, in that state of anxiety, we realize that this is not a conscious intellectual process. Thoughts and feelings of anxiety, they don't necessarily intellectually make sense. So, So where do they come from? Well, where they come from is really the deeper part of our mind, the deeper part of our consciousness, and that's the subconscious mind. And, and that's really a new approach because I think it's very important that we are not just covering up the symptom with medication, but that we actually understanding what's underneath all of this and what's the reason why we have fear and anxiety in the first place. But in our society, what the problem is that we are anxious for no reason. You know, we are anxious because of the what if reality that we are imagining. And then our body basically responds to the stress and anxiety as if we have to right now go through a flight and uh, a fight state. And so we are constantly putting our body in stress mode. And we have to be really aware of is the level of anxiety we have right now really appropriate for what's going on in our life, or is anxiety out of control, and we have to find a way to get back in control. How can we learn to interpret these warning signs? Well, that's a really excellent question, and uh, and I think that's a very important point, that we see the fear and anxiety as messengers that need to be looked at and addressed. Now, the natural response when we have fear and anxiety is that we are looking outside of us, And we don't turn the look inside and ask ourselves, why do I respond to this this way? And uh, what I find that there are three main root causes on a subconscious level that make a person more susceptible to anxiety. And when you address these three root causes, it's almost like as if you all of a sudden have pushed the reboot button and you will respond in complete appropriate ways. One root cause is the emotional baggage that, you know, we all have heard from and uh, we certainly have probably all some, you know, baggage that we are carrying with us through time is like a storage place. But at some point you have so much anxiety stored inside that you're like a pressure cooker ready to explode. And if, you know, any other additional situation happens that cause you anxiety, you're responding 
much more dramatic and much more fast than if that uh, that inner storage system is um, is emptied. The second uh, root cause on the subconscious level is the uh, inner conflict that uh, often people experience when they are anxious. The conflict between a side that feels rather confident or that feels uh, positive and, and wants to be successful. And then there is this other side that holds you back, the side that says, you know, you can't do this, or who do you think you are, or, you know, you will fail. So people that are anxious often feel that they have been for all their life in the middle of a, of a tug of war, and they never felt really congruent. They always felt somehow fragmented with that inner battle, and, and there are very powerful ways to understand both sides of that conflict and, and bring finally a sense of congruency and wholeness so that you can actually feel yourself and not basically as a person who either feels you know, ambitious and, uh, and confident and then right away insecure and anxious again. And then the third one are those limiting core beliefs that we all heard from and uh, we all heard about and, uh, and we unfortunately, most of us don't know how to resolve them and to replace them. And if you have a limiting core belief such as I'm not good enough or the, the world is not a safe place, you will look through the filters of this belief at the world and at yourself and no matter what externally happens, no matter how successful you are, you will still believe that you're not good enough and that you're not safe. And that's the reality that you are internally experiencing. So by changing limiting core beliefs, your world and your perspective on yourself can dramatically improve and you can truly feel empowered. Doctor, where can our listeners go to to get more information about you and your work? Well, uh, visit our website, thefearandanxietysolution.com, in one word. Another website that I have that focuses also on the inner healing work that I'm doing is called cellularwisdom.com, in one word, cellularwisdom.com. We'll be right back. A healthy thought leads to healthy steps forward, and that clearly must start from childhood. The question is, who's stepping up to share wisdom so our children's thoughts direct their lifestyles towards a purposeful, vitalistic existence? I'm Dr. Magwood, a family chiropractor specializing in pediatric and pregnancy care. Let's exercise with our children. In the early years, there is no question our children are sponges for information. They will learn to do as you do. Furthermore, if they see daily rituals of movement activity, they will see drive, determination, and a body functioning at a high level. Get outside with your children. Running and exerting them to exhaustion will have several obvious benefits. Upregulated connections between the brain and the body affect so many areas of life. Watch for improvements in concentration, eating habits, and sleeping patterns, and praise your child as you observe their skills and muscles developing. Remember, exercise is not designed to be a chore or a weight loss regimen. It is fuel for personal challenge, togetherness, and play as we live struggling to balance everything in our lives. My tip is simply this. Tell your family's chiropractic doctor why you aren't exercising and be coached to find intensity and fun moving and developing your physical prowess. I'm Dr. Michael Magwood from Pure Balance Center in Clifton, New Jersey. For more information, reach out to us at purebalancecenter.com or call 973-773-8244. to live a happy, productive life, but sometimes we need a little help. Our Coach on Call experts provide strategies to help you cultivate effective life skills. Joining me today is Karen Chow, a leadership trainer, speaker, and author. Welcome, Karen. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Joan. Thanks for having me on this call. I'm very excited to be here. Karen, the title of this show, Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life, we understand how powerful positive thoughts are, but then there's that limiting negative self-talk. Where do self-limiting thoughts come from? You just hit the nail on the head when you said negative self-talk. You know, I used to think they came from imprints that are left by other people. But in reality, self-limiting thoughts come from years of buildup of negative self-talk. It's always easier to attribute it, you know, to something else other than face your own demons. But the truth is no one tells you anything unless you give them that authority. So that's where I believe it comes from. What impact do these self-limiting thoughts have on our professional success? You know, just as those 
who achieve success because because they don't listen to the noise and the chatter. They listen to the voice inside that guides them through life. And the impact of self-limiting thoughts can tell you falsehoods like you don't deserve it, you don't work hard enough, or you know who do you think you are? So if we train our minds to rethink what we think about ourselves and our abilities, I think we start to believe we're undeserving and not good enough. And the more you tell yourself these things, the more you hold yourself back from achieving success, Joan. And, and you know where this really comes from? I think it stems from fear. We're actually afraid of being successful. Karen, what tips can you offer to help us shift limiting thoughts to more positive beliefs? I have got three for you today. One would be to change some of your habits that you don't even know are habits, like watching too much television or, or the wrong kind of television, um, playing video games, reading smut, and my version of smut is the National Enquirer. <laughs> um, even hanging out with people that you know are, wrong, are the wrong fit for you whose goals or values don't align with yours or drag you down because they want to keep you at their level. And another tip is don't walk. Run to the nearest library, bookstores, get a a bunch of personal growth, professional development books. Help yourself that way. And third is to reframe your thinking by reframing your questions. So the easiest method to go about this is to ask yourself the right questions instead of the wrong ones, like the positive leading ones and not the negative leading ones. So, for example, instead of saying, how much am I going to lose if I don't do A, B, and C?, say, how much am I going to benefit if I do A, B, and C? If you'd like more information about Karen and her work, you can visit her website, karenchow.com. That's C-A-R-Y-N-C-H-O-W.com. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you found the show informative. At Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life, we believe that knowledge is power. Take what you've learned, apply it, and live your best life now. Remember that this information is for educational purposes only and should never replace the advice of a professional who knows your personal situation. If you'd like more information, you can visit our website, cyacyl.com. That stands for Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. While on the site, listen to past shows on demand, read the digital magazine, take part in the book club, sign up for the mailing list, and be sure to follow the show on Facebook and Twitter. Until next time, this is Joan Herman. Thanks for tuning in.